Okay, here we have uh, a structure with the formula C9H10O2, and here's our NMR data. So instead of giving you a spectrum, it's, it's presented to you, um, you know, just in, in numerical form here. Okay, and the problem with NMR that I see again and again working on NMR problems is there's so much information, you could just get blown away by that information, and it's very easy to spend 30 minutes working on an NMR problem and go nowhere because you because you just are grabbing it bits and pieces. Okay, so we're going to develop a systematic approach. We're going to use that same approach every time, and we're going to and hopefully find success in that approach. Okay, so what was our first step? Our first step is to look at the IR spectrum and see what we can uh, figure out from that. But we're not going to be looking at any IRs today. A lot of the problems you're going to see in your in your courses or in the books will have IR combined with NMR, so that you're lucky in those cases. You you get that as an additional clue of what function groups you have. But in all these cases, we're going to be skipping the IR. Okay? Do we have a molecular formula? Well, you won't always be given a molecular formula, but if you're lucky enough to get it, let's use it. So we do have a molecular formula. It's C9H10O2. What can that tell us about the structure? What we need to do is we need to calculate the DU. Okay, the way we calculate the DU is we ask ourselves, if it was saturated, what would the formula be? We have nine carbons. It would be C9H to the, remember it was C to the N, H to the 2N plus 2. So it's 9 times 2 is 18, plus 2 is 20. If it was saturated, it would be C9H20. What do we have? We have C9H10. Okay, so what do we have? We have 10 missing hydrogens, and every two missing hydrogens is a degree of unsaturation or a site of unsaturation. So we have 5 du. So our formula, when we're done, has to account for all five of those. <coughs> uh, okay, now what do we do? We figure out what pieces we have to our puzzle. We use the integration for that. So we have five hydrogens here. Somewhere around seven, what piece does that tell us? What things coming around seven? That would be aromatic protons. We have five of them, so that tells us that we have a monosubstituted benzene ring. We have a benzene ring with one something hanging off of it, attached to it. Okay? We have a two hydrogen signal. What does a two hydrogen signal mean? It means we have a CH2. And when I draw this piece, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw two arms on it. And that's because we know carbon, every carbon is going to have four bonds in our structures when we're done because we're only looking at stable, you know, uh, stable structures. So a CH2 must be attached to two other things to get those four bonds. And what does a three hydrogen signal tell us? That means we have a CH3. A CH3 has just one arm because uh, that would be the fourth bond. So these are our pieces. Are they all of our pieces? Well, what do we have so far? We have uh, C678. We have C8H5678910. Uh, OK, so we've accounted for all of our hydrogens, of course, because they show up in the NMR. It's hard to miss those. But we only have eight carbons shown, so we still have a carbon. We still have two oxygens that we need to account for. Oxygen has two arms, right? Oxygen likes to have two bonds. And what else are we missing? Let's check our formula. Our formula says we need five degrees of unsaturation. How many have we shown so far in these pieces? We've only shown a benzene ring, which has one, two, three, four degrees of unsaturation. So we still have uh, one degree of unsaturation that needs to be in our structure when we're done. Now, this looks like a lot of random pieces, but take a look at this. There's actually a very nice functional group we can imagine that takes care of all three of those. What is a way to have a carbon and an oxygen with a degree of unsaturation? How about a carbonyl? A carbonyl would very nicely um, account for all three of those pieces in one nice you know, uh, functional group that we see all the time. Carbonyls are very, very common in organic molecules. And of course, a carbonyl has two arms. Okay, so these now are our pieces. So we've taken care of this. So we have a phenyl ring, CH2, CH3, carbonyl, and an oxygen. Those are our pieces. Now we're ready to put them together. We start with an end piece, and we decide what it's attached to. So let's start with our CH3. 
what are our choices? We could either attach it, could we attach it to the benzene ring? We can't attach it to a benzene ring because that's an end piece. If we attached a methyl and a, and a benzene, we would now have toluene, our structure would be done. We couldn't fit in any of the other groups. Okay? But I could attach it to a CH2 or an oxygen or a carbonyl. Those are the other possible pieces. How do I decide which one it belongs to? Well, now I take a look. Where's my CH3? I take a look. It must be a singlet. So what does that rule out if it's a singlet? Singlet means that I have zero neighbors, right? I have zero protons on my neighboring carbon. So I can't attach it to the CH2. That would split it. But it could be the oxygen or the carbonyl. How do I decide which one it is? Well, I take a look at the chemical shift. Is that the chemical shift I would expect when I'm next to an oxygen or when I'm alpha to a carbonyl? That means I'm alpha to a carbonyl. If I put it next to an oxygen, that brings me too far downfield, brings me closer to four. So I must have this attached to the carbonyl. Okay, that took care of this piece, that took care of this piece. What comes next? What are my options? I can either have uh, an oxygen or I can have a CH2. Okay, now it turns out in this case, let's take a look at that. Let's put the oxygen first and then the CH2. And then the last piece I would have is the benzene. Or the other possibility, we're down to just two possible structures. We could have the CH2 and then the oxygen. Okay, and we can use, um, the, would that explain the chemical shift and the splitting pattern for the CH2? It would actually, because this is a singlet, which is uh, true in both cases. And it comes at around five. How does it get all the way to five? Well, it's both next to an oxygen and it's next to something else. In this case, a benzene ring, it's benzylic. In this case, next to a carbonyl. So actually, both of these answers are reasonable. The way I would distinguish between uh, the two of them, if I had some tables, maybe I can calculate it a little more precisely to see which one best matches 5.1. But the other thing uh, that's, that's, that I would recognize um, if I, it's a little more sophisticated is I know that having an oxygen on a benzene ring is going to have some resonance, which is going to make some of these protons much different, give them a much different chemical environment, electronic environment, than the others. So because it is a five hydrogen singlet, I'm expecting all these hydrogens to be very similar and therefore just attached to a regular CH2. And so this is the best match. This is the best match. Occasionally we might have a case where there's more than one possible answer, um, but, but that's, that's pretty, pretty, this is a, this is a pretty rare situation. Okay, let's try a different one.